Hi, Design in Java. Um, I'm Georgia, and today I will be talking to you about data. But I will not talk about technology or algorithms, and I'll definitely not be talking about big data. I will instead um, guide you through a tour on through small, imperfect, serendipitous, and very human data. But let's start from the beginning. Um, in my day job, I run a data visualization design company called Accurate, which is split between Milan in Italy, which is my home country, and New York. And we are a team of designers, engineers, and data scientists, and we design and develop w ways to make data and information accessible through visual representations, as you can see from this quick montage of our latest digital applications. So as you can imagine, we work across different industries, creating different kinds of interactive digital products, both for internal and external audiences. And each time we imagine a custom visualization and a custom interaction based on the specific data and audiences that we are working working with. But personally, um, no matter what the final output is, I really approach data in a very analog way. I always start from sketching. It is my way to make sense out of numbers without the limits that comes imposed by software. So sketching with data and removing the technology from the equation before bringing it back helps me focusing primarily on the nature of these numbers, or on their organization and on their deep meaning. And in fact, I used to say that I use drawing with data as an asset. I like to say that I draw with the data that I'm working on and I'm working with in my mind, but not in my pen. And personally, I really think that drawing with data is really an invaluable tool to discover what is unique about these numbers at hand. And sometimes this sort of handcrafted approach to data produces kind of artifacts that are not necessarily what you would expect data to be represented on, such as in this project that I've been working for, uh, the Malaria No More organization, where data has been used as a material to produce a narrative scarf telling the story of the fight against malaria over the, dec the last decade. So my whole research as an information designer, an entrepreneur, and an artist is about finding a way to use data, even in contexts you wouldn't expect, as a pair of new eyes, as a second pair of eyes to learn to see more and hopefully better. Because what my job has taught me over the years is that to really understand data and their true potential, sometimes we actually have to forget about them and learn how to see through them instead. So what I'm going to show you today are two projects, actually two collaborations between me and two amazing women that hopefully can make you feel how this personal handcrafted approach to data can reveal aspects of our life and our human experience that we might be missing. So the first one, uh, the one that doesn't involve a guitar, is called Dear Data. Uh, it's a zero technological and very laborious experiment that data that was for me the big data hangover cure. It was a collaboration with information designer Stephanie Pozovic. We actually only met a few times in our lives, but we decided to work together because we found out that we have so many personal and work similarities. We're both expat, I'm an Italian living in New York, and Stephanie is an American living in London. We're both the same age, not going into too many details here. <laughs> We're also both only children, self-centered and self-absorbed, but in general, we seemingly really have lived parallel lives for many other aspects that I'm not bothering you with, because most importantly, we share this very handcrafted approach and way of working with data, preferring drawing as opposed to coding as the entry point to get to know our numbers. So we decided to challenge ourselves. Is it possible to get to know another human being through data and drawings only? And we started one year-long analog hand-drawn data correspondence through the Atlantic, where every weekend for one year we use our personal data to get to know each other. Personal data around weekly shared mundane topics, from our complaints to the interaction with our partners, from the compliments we received to the sounds of our surrounding, personal information that they we would then manually hand-drawn on a postcard size sheet of paper that every week we would send from New York to London and from London to New York. Where the front of the postcard contains no text or explanation at all, it is hopefully a beautiful drawing that one could just take as an illustration if she didn't know that there are data behind. But the back of the card contains, of course, the address of the other person, the title of the project, and the legend, so how to interpret our drawings, where every week we abstracted our visual choices to let the other person understand what happened in the week through our data. 
So eventually the postcard arrived at the other person's address with all of the scuff marks of his journey over the ocean. And we didn't send each other any digital scan of our cards. We both have been really eagerly waiting to get the data weekly portrait of the other person on the mailbox for, one, for over one year, also rediscovering the pleasure of checking the postbook as you get home. So it has really been a type of slow data, small data, and incredibly analog data transmission. So during a time when everybody talks about big data and virtual reality, we of course do small data and physical postcards, you know. Well, it doesn't sound very revolutionary, but by removing technology from the equation, we have been forced to extend ourselves as designers. Because on the one hand, we have each been forced to invent and create 52 each visual languages because from scratch, because hand drawing with data really leads you to design that are incredibly customized to the data that you're working with. But also, removing the computer from the equation triggered us to find different ways to look at data as excuses to tell something about ourselves. In fact, as we gathered our weekly data, uh, from the beginning, we conceived the project as more as a personal documentary than a quantified self-project. Because as you will see here, we didn't only quantify numbers, but we have been adding qualitative details to our data collection. For example, the very first week of Dear Data, which is a pretty cold and impersonal topic, how many times do we check the time in a week? So here is the front of my postcard, and you can see that every little symbol represents all of the times that I check the time, position per days and per hours, chronologically, nothing really complicated here. But then you can, well, <laughs> that leads to me. <laughs> but then you can see in the legend how I added anecdotal details about these moments. In fact, the different types of symbols indicate why I was checking the time. What was I doing? Was I bored? Was I hungry? Was I late? Did I check it on purpose or just casually glance at the clock? And this is the key part, representing the details of my days on my personality through my data collection, using data as a filter, as a lens, to discover and reveal, for example, my never-ending anxiety for being late, even though I'm absolutely always on time. <laughs> so, Stephanie and I spent one year collecting our data manually to force us to focus on the nuances that computers cannot gather, or at least not yet, using data also to explore our minds and not only our activities, like in week number three, where we track the thank yous we said and we received. And when I realized that I thank mostly the people that I don't know, apparently I'm a compulsive thanker to waitresses and waiters, <laughs> but I definitely don't thank enough the people who are close to me. We also ventured into more negative types of sharing, like at week number seven, when we mapped our complaints. And I composed this musical complaint card, borrowing a very literal visual inspiration from the music notation system to show the repetitiveness of my complaints over time. And then I added some details about their type, their loudness. Did I truly need to complain? Figuring out that in the end, most of my complaints were totally avoidable. Then, as the project evolved, we figured that also we can find data even beyond the daily tracking and make a survey of what we own, for example. So, walk into our closets with the eyes of the data collector and finding data, looking for data in the way we categorize and classify our clothes, their colors, the way we organize them, how often do we wear them, which is quite interesting and is really telling a lot about a person. And, well, what it tells about me is that I have a lot to learn from my boyfriend. <laughs> well, at the time, boyfriend, now husband, which, as you can see, clearly has a much more optimized strategy when it comes to his outfit. <laughs> anyway. Um, but also, we, we also try to see if we can use data to become better human beings, at least for a week, and, to, and perform acts to then be able to report them. Like this week, we really intentionally and purposely smiled to strangers, trying so hard to catch the eyes of the people that I was running to and smiling. And it, it was really tr tracking their reaction, if they smiled back, if they didn't notice, and um, smiling very nicely, even if sometimes I realized um, it was not so easy to put together really a nice smile. And I can tell you that this is one of the things that sticks with me the most, even after more than one year that the project is over. I still do smile more, and I'm still definitely much more aware of what I do and what I feel. 
In fact, over one year, the process of actively noticing and counting these types of action really became a, ritually, a ritual and actually changed ourselves. Both Stephanie and I became much more in tune with ourselves and aware of our behaviors and our surroundings. So Stephanie and I connected at a very deep level through our data. We truly became close friends through our data. But we could do this only because we put ourselves in these numbers, adding the context of our very personal stories to them. And that was the only way to make this data truly representative of ourselves. Dear Data was a personal project that led to many exhibitions and also to a book that has been released last September and that has found the most exciting home as the original set of our postcards has recently been acquired as part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, which we couldn't be happier and prouder about. But what makes us even happier than this is that the project has been so well received, really incredibly well received. We've seen thousands of postcards made by people who discovered about the project and wanted to experiment on themselves or started the data correspondence to be in touch with long-distance friends in this new way. Or even we've seen teachers of any grade, like primary school teachers and secondary school teachers, who use this format to teach their students the word of data. It has really opened the idea of data to a wider audience and made it more approachable, understandable, and more easily relatable to their daily life. And this is why I argue that we have to reclaim a personal approach to how all kind of data is captured, analyzed, and displayed, really proving that subjectivity and context play a very deep role in any story with data when we want the audience to truly relate. And more in general, I believe that working with data in this sort of uncommon and personal way can really help us revealing the hidden patterns, patterns behind what we experience in our everyday life. And to this point, uh, here I am with the second experience I want to share with you today. So apparently life helps me stumble into people that I desperately want to know. There was another woman um, I didn't know until recently, but she is not a designer. Uh, she's a musician and actually a pretty gorgeous and well-known musician, and her name, of course, is Kaki King, as you might have guessed for the intro. So Kaki grew up playing the guitar and the drums, and she applies the techniques of both instruments as she plays her guitar. And truly, listening to her playing is like hearing six hands together or eight hands together. It's really incredible. So what Kaki and I share is not our field of expertise, but our hands at work. What we are aiming to do together is finding a way to use data to deconstruct and reveal the textures of what makes this music that she plays so beautiful. And to do so, we've created a visualization that we would like you to enjoy now while Kaki plays, and we will explain it to you later. But now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, please, Kaki King.
Yes. Hi, hello, Design and Daba. My name's Kaki King. I am so delighted that Georgia, Georgia really did invite me to join her as her guest, so I am just incredibly honored. <laughs> um, I've been a very busy touring professional guitar player for the last 15 years, and it's only recently that I've added visual art to my guitar setup, as you can see with a projection mapped guitar. Um, opening my performances to the visual art world has just thrown me down many, many beautiful rabbit holes. Uh, and this one has led me to my first visit to Africa, to South Africa, to Cape Town. So thank you very much. Um, as Georgia said earlier, although we both rely on digital technology to fully realize our work, everything starts with our hands. Everything is very manual. And any kind of artistic pursuit that begins in the hands and the fingers, whether it's music or sculpture or painting, connects you as an artist to a legacy that lasts, that goes back thousands and thousands of years to the first person that made a mark in a stone. And um, there's something, uh, the respect for the past is felt very viscerally when we work this way. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. So what you've just heard is a song that has been composed starting from a question. What is that what we do with our hands, the medium that we both use for our work, can tell about us? Of course, we collected data about it. <laughs> so we, can, we collected one mundane and ordinary, very ordinary day of personal data about all of the things that we did with our hands and all of the things that can be telling of our personality. So what and who do we touch, did we touch? What was the gesture? What was the sensation? And uh, we let this data inform our collaboration. Uh, yeah, so this is a uh, text that I sent to Georgia saying, personal data collection is completely exhausting. I don't know how you did this for a year. And, and Georgia thought this was apparently hilarious. Um, <laughs> because truly, when you're, when you're thinking, especially when you're doing something with your hands, everything you touch, everything you do, suddenly has this deep meaning to it and has to be recorded and has to be marked. And from, you know, picking up a guitar to opening a door to... Take, you know, giving my daughter a bath to that time when I keep scratching this part of my head because I'm nervous, like all of it becomes, you, the self-awareness is almost yeah. uncomfortable. But and not all is bad because yes. then there's a real realization. And then, uh, yeah, so then I said this complete self-awareness, it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just I've never paid this much attention to something my physical body is doing, not in this way, not even with the guitar, and I've been playing guitar since I was four years old. And so experiencing it is truly strange and not strange in a bad way, just again, this ability to give meaning and also make a mark and make a time point and make a feeling on everything that you do with your hands. It's pretty intense. <laughs> Um, so then we used this merged data, we merged our data collection. So we used this data of a day in our four hands to create what we call the visual score, the khaki used to compose the song that you've heard. Um, this is a detail of what the score that I ended to khaki looked like, of course, super detail. Very where obvious, <laughs> very obvious <laughs> where song. All of our touches are represented and translated into a visual symbol. You can see in the legend that um, everything is represented by a specific symbol or color, so the feelings about this type of context, their duration, the type of action, what is a grabbing, a picking, a pulling, a pushing, also whether we use our left hand or right hand or both. And I handed this score to Kaki, driving her a little crazy, who composed the marvelous song that you've heard. Um, there is only so much information that you can give to a musician via traditional notation. And there's something that guitar players use also called tablature, which is literally telling people where to place their fingers on the neck of the guitar. But especially with the way that I play, I use a lot of unorthodox technique. I use things that normal people aren't doing. There's no way to tell in notation, turn your hand upside down and do this on the guitar neck. Um, and so luckily, Georgia was able to develop this entirely new visual system. And so you can see now how lucky I was to meet Georgia and to have her excitement to enter into this project with a guitar player such as myself who doesn't really play by the rules. 
And then I'm turning her into data visualization designer because she annotated everything that she did. Right, which was interesting because suddenly again, I'm aware of everything I'm doing on the guitar, every pluck, every th things that would come naturally to a musician who's just done it with their muscle memory, suddenly I have to think about exactly precisely what movements my hand makes. So this is a tweet I sent, which of course I knew only the great Georgia Lupi would understand. So, but we're not going into many detail about this part because what we wanted to do with this dialogue back and forth between us and between our hands was actually getting to know the way we work um, to be able to ultimately using what I do, which is data visualization, to help people and hopefully you today understand more of what Kaki does with her hands and to help you see her music as you hear it. So finally, I meticulously visualized all of the data about what she plays. So all of the things that she does with her hands from the beginning to the end of her song, um, and, and that became the work, the artwork that you're seeing. But instead of focusing on a linear representation of the music, which would have been simply a visualization of the scores or the, the partitures and tablatures, I played with a different approach here, following the repetitive nature of the song, which is clearly structured by section, and maybe you can right. elaborate a little more on well, that. Well, the song that I wrote, was intended to have interchangeable sections that could be played one after the other, so that you could kind of randomize the sections and it would still feel like a, a, a successful composition. So there really wasn't an A to B or like, you know, A to Z type of construction where here's the beginning and here's the end, which would allow Georgia to do something that is like this, which is almost circular and there's a path that you can follow or take a diversion from. So uh, we, can give you, we will give you a little um, explanation of what all this means, hopefully not giving you a headache, and Kaki uh, will help us, um, will help you understand it. So each section is one compound element, let's call them flowers, where the number of the underlying lines that you see corresponds to the number of the beats, and the symbols above represent the song being played. Everything that you see on the top of this flower represents what Kaki does with her left hand, and the bottom part is everything that she does with her right hand. So every thick line that you see, the thicker lines in the flowers, corresponds to a measure of Kaki's song. Kaki, would you explain what a measure is? This is one measure. <laughs> Then for each measure, we have the internal divi dividers that follow the beat of the song. Then these temporary yellow lines that you see are my grid to show the six strings, to overimpose the six string of Kaki's guitar to show you which string she's playing on. That wasn't very good. <laughs> And so every note that she plays at any given time, our position on the top of the flower really corresponding to the strings. And when you see the colored and double rounded dot uh, notes or like symbols, it means that these are the play, the one that she plays on the downbeat, which gives more structure to the song. And then on the top part, of course, because we want to over-detail everything that we do, there are details about what fingers she uses on each beat. And actually what she does with the fingers, so the type of touches that produce different type of sound, as you can see here in the close-up of the flowers. And yeah, it took, a, it took us a little bit of time to annotate the whole song, but I think it was worth it. Um, and then there's the right hand at the bottom of the flower. So the structure here is exactly the same, following the top part in a symmetric way, so measures and beats. And what Kaki does with her right hands is highlighted by these different colors that you can follow through the song. And this is super fascinating. When you see the black dash on the right hand, it means that she goes all the way up with the right hand to pluck a string on the neck of the guitar. And if you look closely, you start noticing the differences between these flowers. So the empty spaces that change on the bottom of the flowers, the repetitiveness of some patterns in the similar sections which are highlighted by the same background color. And maybe you start noticing that there are two flowers that look slightly different with definitely less elements and no colors for the right hand highlighted. And this is because these are percussive sessions that Kaki here plays very differently as you're hearing and seeing. And here we are again with the full visualization. 
So our goal here is to be able to produce a visual that simultaneously could display the melody that is being played, just like in a score, but also where the notes are played on the neck of the guitar, like in a tablature. But then also how Kaki plays them with her hands, so the movements of her hands on the neck of the guitar, the types of different touches and the different fingers that she uses. But also, as you can see, to have a bird's a bird eye view of the structure of the song. And ultimately, on my side, um, also to show a more subjective and, let's say, artistic interpretation of the atmosphere that the song evoked me as I listened to it. One thing I want to say is that being able to look at something like, I'm looking at here, but you're looking at here, this is such an incredible way to see my music realized. I mean, it's just such an honor. It's just so incredible. Um, I think that uh, not only am I playing a song that now has data attached to it that then can be visualized, but it brings me back to that original data collection. When I was opening doors, when I was washing my daughter's hair, when I was picking my nose, whatever. I mean, like, I, I think of those things as I play the song now. So it's infused with much more meaning, and I hope that you can understand that, like, beyond the song, beyond the visual, there's... All of it has data beyond it, and, and I hope that walking you through our process has allowed you to understand that. And of course, also for me, like seeing my data not only visualized by play, but also played, um, and seeing the data that we collected not only visualized that is in my practice, but, but you know, really translated into music is something that to me extended what I think of data visualization, what I think of uh, myself as, as a data artist. So, to enjoy the very last part of our show, as Kaki will play for you again, we are just asking you to start seeing the music. So maybe pick one series of elements to focus on, her left fingers on the top of the flowers, the structure of the color of each section, her right hands at the bottom of the flowers, or even just particular colors and symbols that you feel attracted to and that you can follow. Let it, letting these kind of symbols be your guide through the song. So we hope you can start seeing what she does, enjoying her music even more through data. So thank you, but now to you, Kaki.
Thank you. Mm.